What's going on, hockey fans? The NCDC Deneen Cup playoffs have reached the Final Four, the penultimate series before we reach our Deneen Cup championship series, April 26th to the 28th, hosted by the winners in the East. Before we talk about that East matchup, before we go out to the mountain division, to the high altitudes, and talk about the high-flying hockey in the mountain, I got to introduce in my left-hand man, my consigliere, mon frere, from another mayor, Lucas Jones. It's NCDC playoff season, baby. What do we got? Playoffs. Playoffs? Playoffs. Playoffs. It's down to four teams. And it's not that we thought that these teams were going to be the ones in the final four, but we had an inkling, right? Ever since we watched that PAL South Shore Islanders Hockey Club triumvirate of teams throughout the season, right? They've had battles. They've had great games against each other. But by and large, those three teams have been at the top of the mountain for a while. Mercer and Utica in the, the Atlantic Division and the North Division, respectively, as a train whistle goes off behind. What is happening? What is happening in New Jersey right now? Those teams made a good run for it. The Utica Junior Comets, the Mercer Chiefs. I mean, what a season those two teams had. But it's been these it's been these these three teams here. And now you're down to South Shore PAL. Out west, you've got Ogden and Utah, who, you know, two teams that have you feel like have been one and two for a large majority of the season. An early start from the Provo Predators, they sort of faded. And Utah just always ever present coming back. And now we're in a space where these four teams are gonna battle it out for a chance to win the Deneen Cup. Yeah, and, and you look at it, I mean, two guys had PAL and South Shore one and two, vice versa, in the power rankings every single month for the entire season and never pulled them off there. And that's Crazy. Where, where it ends up. And then you look at the other side of things, Utah and Ogden have been our top two in the Mountain Division all season long. These are two great series, Lucas. We got to split the divisions up here, divide and conquer. We're making picks, we're making selections, we're making predictions, we're doing breakdowns. Where do you want to start? Do we go west or do we go east? I say we go west. Let's start Let's there. go go west, young man. Fording the trail. We're in our little Oregon Trail setup. Remember Oregon Trail? What a game. What a game. Entirely text-based game. Incredible. Incredible game back in the day. I used to love playing it. But let's go west, young man. And we look at this series between the Ogden Mustangs and the Utah Outliers. The Utah Outliers team that took four games to get here. An Ogden Mustangs team that took four games, including two overtime battles to get here. The one tough loss for Ogden, Lucas, was a crazy play in front of their own net. Where it kind of put it a little own goal action. Looked a little more Premier League soccer than NCDC League hockey. But you know what? To bounce back and win an OT the next night for Ogden, Brody Simcoe off a, just a delicious face-off win, drives to the net, unassisted game winner. That was a great turnaround for this team. You look at the postseason, it's the story of two net miners, Lucas. We start there. Nikita Volsky for Ogden, four games played in this postseason so far, 3 0 0 and 1, a 1 6 1 goals against, and a 9 4 9 saves percentage. On the other side, a guy that got off to a slow playoff start but has dominated since, it's Philip Funky Cool Rondina. 3-1-0 in the postseason. He's got a shutout to his name. That was the series clincher. Stopped 107 pucks so far, a 2-4-9 goals against, and a 9-3-0 saves percentage. Goaltending, going to be the place we start. I think it has to be, right? You've seen these teams out west play these crazy high-scoring games, right? Utah and Provo went 5-3 in a game earlier this month when they when they played each other, right? But then... You've also got 2 nothing, which was the game that ended up deciding the series. So the goaltending, regardless of the score, is going to be elite. That much I can tell you. I think the difference comes from how well the defense plays. That's your real, that's where you really have to look. The netminers and the defense paired up together because there's some talented shooters out West. They love to put the puck in front of the net. They love to play physically. They create a lot of chaos and you know, you think a 9-3-0 is going to always result in really low-scoring games, but you can have a 9-3-0 and let in a bunch of goals. It's just how it works out West. Yeah, coming into the series, a tale of the tape. The Utah Outliers, 13 goals for, 11 against in their series to get here against Provo. 12 goals for and 7 goals against for the Ogden Mustangs. The power play percentages, 
five for 17 on the power play for Utah in that first round series, a 29.41 success rate. On the other side, eight of 20 for Ogden. That's 40%. That's ridiculous. That's just stupid. Even more importantly, at home, they scored 50% of the time on the power play. They had eight of their 12 total goals on the power play. Got to stay out of the box against Ogden. Penalty kills, folks. Four goals against on 14 attempts for Utah, not where they want that to be, a 71.43% rate. Tough on the PK for them, has not been their, their greatest PK percentage so far in the postseason, playing against probably the best power play unit left in this tournament on the other side from Ogden. That'll be a big storyline here. Penalty kill for Ogden, it has been the best in the postseason so far. One goal allowed on 16 attempts, a 93.75% uh, rate. Lucas, Special teams going to be big. Special teams, special players. Hey, hello, brother. You know, special teams, uh, the reverse Mr. Beast, you know, uh, didn't they, you know, taking things away, not giving them to them. You know, we're, we're, we're rocking sketch right now. I mean, look, I am tangentially aware of sketch. I am not, I have not, much like an eclipse, I have not stared directly at any of sketch's content. I am aware that it existed. Um, but I, I think you make a great point on the special teams, right? It is. In a close series, special teams is the killer. That's not groundbreaking analysis, right? That's anyone who's watched hockey understands that. But I think the big thing that these two teams have to be aware of is you've got potentially, right, five games if necessary, five games to not just battle each other, but five games to prepare for what you're going to get out east. I think yep. another piece of not so groundbreaking analysis is that the, the game styles are a little different. The West plays physically. The East still plays physically, but not as physically, not as consistently physically, and certainly not as hard hitting at its highest point, right? And the officials reflect that. The referees do a great job all across the USPHL, all across the NCDC, all across the country. But there's some differences. And so the West teams have sometimes struggled coming East with the brand of physicality they play. So they've got five games, not just to figure out what their special teams are going to do, but more importantly, Dan, figure out how to not take those penalties, how to avoid those special teams opportunities. Cause it's, it's the game that comes after the game. That's important. The battle for the Deneen cup. Yeah. And Lucas, how about a guy in Dimitri Voyatsis on the Ogden side, three assists in the series, didn't even have to score a goal to get through that one against Idaho falls. No goals, three assists for him. And Brody Simcoe, six goals in four games in the postseason so far. He's got a Hattie in the tournament, 23 goals in the whole season in 49 games, and just four, he's got six. The bigger story, Lucas, there have been three games won by Ogden in the postseason, and all three game-winning goals off the blade of Brody Simcoe. Simcoe is going to have to be a guy you must stop if you want to win a series if you're Utah. You're going to have to, right? It is. We just saw it, I think, with both the men's and women's uh, college basketball championships, right? You can stop the star or you can stop the team, but you got to succeed at one of them, right? You have to stop one of the two. If you fail at both, then you're in real trouble. But I think Simcoe has been successful despite the fact that teams are covering him, despite the fact that he's a marked man right now. I think that goes to show not just the talent, but that in the game of hockey, it just takes one guy to get hot at the right time. Just someone to put the team on their back in those moments. Start Either start firing pucks at the net if you're a forward, make great plays if you're a defender, or if you're a goalie, make some of the crazy arm-spinning saves that make a highlight reel. Some of the other leading scores in the postseason so far for Ogden, three goals, two assists, and five total points for Max Von Klingraff. William Cherniak, one goal, four assists for five points. And Casper Conradson Kelgard, no goals, four assists, four points in the tourney so far. A lot of different places that Kenny Orlando and his Ogden team can go to find scoring. On the other side, Garrett Joss leading the way, four goals, four assists, eight points. We talk about balance and scoring all the time, Lucas. When a guy can assist as much as he can score it, he's a tough cover. I mean, what do you do, right? If you're in a two-on-one against him, do you go for shot or go for pass if you're a defender? Either way, he's probably going to find a way to score a goal, right? It's that unselfish type of play that's so necessary in a playoff run. It's not that you throw the regular season out the window, but the playoffs are different. They just are, right? It's about making those individual plays. It's just about winning one game at a time. And when you have a guy who can kind of do it all, he becomes that X factor. Yeah, and Lucas, you look down the list here, Makar Klochkov, 
No goals, but four assists in the tourney so far, four points for him. Mateo Mitrovic, he's an interesting story. One goal, three assists, four points. Nathan Huntington, one goal, three assists, four points. And Daniil Chuparnov, two, one, and three on the tournament so far. I mean, you start to look at this series. We start Friday, April 12th, 7.15 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. That's Mountain Daylight Time, MDT, not MST. I learned this just a week or two ago, and I will remember it forever. There's MST, and then when we hit Daylight Savings Time, it's MDT. We change it. It's confusing. I don't like it. It confuses me. We just just get rid of it. That's it. Just get rid of it, because you know what's even worse? There are some places that don't acknowledge the change in time in the U.S., so there are places that don't have a daylight savings time inside of a country that that has it. Just keep time the same. Stop trying to mess with time. Life is hard enough as it is without having to remember to set my clocks forward or set them back. Especially if you listen, you got a flight. If you're like if you're like me and like you can't sleep before a flight because you're so nervous you're gonna miss it. The daylight savings time, the constant threat of never knowing when it actually is, keeps me up at least ten days out of the year. I can't handle it anymore. Yeah, and, and you know, you look at it right now. This is this is a series that is at the ice sheet Friday night and Saturday night at 7:15 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Then we move over to Utah. They'll host games three and four, four if necessary. 7:45 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. That starts Tuesday, April 16th, and potentially a game five if needed would come back to the ice sheet. Best of five series. You got to win three. How important is game one on Friday night? Is this is this a series where you think you can lose game one and bounce back, or is this momentum tells the story? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if it's necessarily subverting the the analysis expectation, but I don't think game one's important at all. You know, I think that you've had a little bit of a rest if you're both sides here. Not a ton, but a little bit of a rest. There are two opponents that you've seen each other uh, all season long. I just don't think game one's that important, right? I, I think that whether it's a close game and it's a hard-fought battle and it sets the tone, or whether it's a blowout from one side and another team has to really regroup, I, I just don't think the winner of Game 1 has any impact on the se- on the series itself. Lucas, this is going to be a fun one. Again, Garrett Joss is eight points. That's good enough for the fourth most of anybody in the playoffs. The storyline, though, he's played four games. The three ahead of him, Ryan Kearney, Ryan Franks, Heike Vertanen from PAL have all played seven games so far in the postseason. Eight points for Garrett Joss, Joss in just four games. An insane tournament for him so far. He will be a must stop. The Simcoe v. Joss storyline will play out all event long. Let's get towards the selection here, Lucas. It's time to make a pick. Would you like to pick first in the mountain or second in the mountain? I will pick first in the mountain. Okay. Let's see what you got, Lucas. Go ahead. I am going to take the Utah Outliers here. Ooh, okay. And this is no disrespect to the season that the Ogden Mustangs have had. But I think I look at a Utah team that felt like it, that they felt like they were being disrespected all season long. That's the vibe that I get from this Utah side, that they felt like they should have been talked about a little bit more, that they thought they should have been the more clear favorite, especially in that Provo series. Ogden struggled at times with the Spud Kings and that resurgence of a team. Utah struggled at times with Provo, but it just looked like when they won, they were a little bit more assertive about it. I think that is what will carry over into the series. I've got Utah, and I've actually got this series going the distance, Dan. Yeah, I look at Utah, you look at some of the depth, right? You look at Evan England, you look at Brady Jones, Michael Schwartz, Ryan Cooper. You talk about Magzan Sagadiev with, with an assist in this series. Talk about Connor Mariner, you know, Mason Keller. There's a lot of depth on this team. When you go to the Ogden side, you've got similar depth, right? You've got the ability to score in bunches. You've got 12 different guys who have tallied a point so far. The blue line has been a big part of it, getting those extra, those little add-on assists with Grant Heinemann, Ethan Hall, Owen Hendrickson, Dimitri Voyatsis with three assists, Teddy Hember getting involved, Samuel Anderson. This is two teams with some good veteran leadership, some young talent, some ability to score in space. It is tough to go into Ogden and win games on the road. Ogden's power play has been stellar. 
Utah's penalty kill has struggled. When I look in net, I love Philip Rondina. I also love Nikita Volsky. I think the two best net miners left on the west side of this tournament bracket are in net for these two teams. Rondina is a difference maker. If I was a scout watching right now, I'd be locking this young man down for the future at the collegiate ranks. He is a difference maker for my team. Rondina, again, three and one in the tournament. He's 6'4, 220, catches with the left hand. In his final season of junior hockey, he's a difference maker. On the other side, 6'2, 185 for Volsky. Paul Taylor's a great playoff coach, but I just, it has been Utah's division to lose for a couple of years. They've gone out there and they've been dominant. I think Ogden wire to wire has kept that top seed. They've sometimes had a tough matchup with this side, but I think they get it done. I think that Ogden wins it in five games. I think no one wins a road game in the series. I think that Ogden's power play is the difference. I think Utah struggles to stay out of the box and I think a power play goal in game five off the stick of Dimitri Voyatsis seals this series up and they win by one. I've got Ogden in five games. You're over there. You're, you're less analyzing hockey and more writing a movie script is what it feels like I on your side. Trying my best. I mean, that's our goal, right? Our goal, our one and only goal should be to promote this league. And I help you said our goal was going to be to write the script and we can't let them know the secret. Oh, we almost gave yeah. away the secret. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. If I were going to write the script, I would win the trophy at the end. Everybody would play, and then they'd put me on their shoulders like Rudy at the end of Rudy, and they'd go, Dan K. Dan, Dan K. have my trophy, coach. Dan K. Dan K. I want Dan K. to skate in my place, and I'm being in the background going, please, I don't want to. I don't want this. I'm so old and broken. Don't let me do it. But no, this is, this is exciting. Let's go to the east side. So Lucas with Utah, Dan K. with Ogden. We go to the eastern portion of the country here. The New England champions, the South Shore Kings, just a, a this is a team that struggled and bounced around a bit throughout the season, but just a hostile takeover of the New England in this postseason. Five and oh, haven't dropped a game, played a number one seeded IHC team, had to go on the road to do it, just took care of it. And now they're like, let's go get the other Islanders. We got rid of one Islanders. Let's get rid of the other Islanders. They're going after PAL now. And this is a team that has yet to lose in the tournament, taking on a PAL team that they dropped one here, they dropped one there, but 5-2-0 in the postseason, defending the Neen Cup champions, can Marku and his side get it done again? If you live on an island, the South Shore Kings are coming for you. They will not stop until every Islander has been defeated. Um, I, You know, South Shore, just what a season. I think that they've been one of the most fun teams to follow because they started off hot. They continued to be great. We said they slipped a little bit towards the end of the season, right? But when you're on top, there's only one one way to go, right? And the, the great Ronnie James Dio would tell you that the only way to go is down. And South Shore, they haven't, though. They may have slipped into second place. They may not have been the top seed, but I just, Dan, are you taking the advice literally right now? Is that what's happening? I was uh, reaching for my phone because I am uh, unprofessional. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad we got that on record. Um, but I, I think that South Shore showed who they were in that first series. South Shore showed who they were against the Islanders Hockey Club. They are no nonsense. They never stop. There is no way to get them to stop. You have to outplay them, right? They're a team, I think, that learned from their series with PAL last year in the championship. They learned that they have to be nearly bulletproof because – the team that I see this year from South Shore, they can only be outplayed. They cannot be denied. And I think that's one of their strengths. This South Shore team, this PAL team all year long have been in a little neck and neck horse race in the top of the Dan K show power rankings. One and two, two and one, one and two, two and one. One team beat the other for the Deneen Cup championship last year. Will South Shore get their revenge? Where P will PAL do it again? The big storylines in this, the big man, Heike Vertanen, probably my favorite player. I, this is a guy, if I was building a team at this level, I'd go get Heike Vertanen tomorrow. You plant him in front of the net. He's a difference maker on the power play. He makes life tough for you. He's tough to move around. Nine points in the postseason. 
Ryan Kearney's come up huge in the tourney, three, seven, and 10. Carter Hanrahan, two, five, and seven. Ty Broad, two, five, and seven. Ryan Franks, four, five, and nine. This is a PAL team that over seven games, they've got three, the three top scorers in the tournament. They're seven for 30 on the power play, 23.33%. On the penalty kill, they're, they've only allowed three goals, 87.25 in 24 attempts on the PK. They have been solid enough on special teams to get the job done. They've seen Mercer and Jersey. I would argue, though, on the other side, the harder schedule and the harder road to this series right now has been South Shores, and they've gone 5-0, and seeing Utica and sweeping them, then going to IHC and sweeping them. 21 goals for, eight goals against, three power play goals and 17 attempts, only a 17% success rate on the power play. That'll be a storyline in this one. Can they find a way to be a little bit more into pay dirt territory on the power play? Penalty killing wise, though, they have been stellar yet again. Tyler Holsky's PK unit is always dominant. One goal allowed on the power play in 17 attempts, 94.12%. Besting only one other team, the Ogden Mustangs, who were you said were one of 16, one in 17 for, for the South Shore Kings, the best PK unit left in the tourney. Uh, penalty kill gurus, right? And that's going to be a huge part of the strategy. Again, it's it's I know it's cliche to talk about the special teams play, but it is so important. I think for PAL, that's going to be their key. Their key is they're going to have to find a way to make the most of those opportunities. Because five on five, these two teams probably going to be one of the most even matchups all year. It was a championship last year. They're back this year. I don't think that's a coincidence. They're teams that can recruit. They're teams that can develop. They follow the the model of the NCDC well, right? Which is just developing these players into absolute stars. And I think for PAL, they just have to stick to the game plan. They have to make sure that they don't look across and see a South Shore team that they beat last year. They can't look across and see a South Shore team that has absolutely run through the North Division in the playoffs. They have to look across and see just their opponent they've got to beat in five. Yep. And, and Lucas, it's going to be a tale in this series as well of who's playing in net. They've played 12 games combined, these two teams. Only two netminders have ever touched the ice. Ryan Keyes has been the number one statistical netminder in this division. I mean, in this tournament. Nicholas Bevilacqua has been the number two statistical netminder in this tournament. Ryan Keyes, 5-0. and oh. He's seen 174 shots. He's only allowed eight goals, a 147 goals against average, a 954 saves percentage, both the best in the playoffs so far, and a shutout to his name. Nicholas Bevilacqua, the second best right now by mere millimeters, 5-2-0-0. Oh, oh. He's seen 236 shots and st- only allowed 11 goals. He's got a 159 goals against, second best in the tournament behind only Ryan Keyes and a 953 saves percentage behind only Ryan Keyes by one percentage point. One shutout in the series as well. Bevilacqua, Ryan Keyes. I mean, is there a netminder you'd rather have than either of these two guys? Like, I can't I can't pick between the two. They're both stellar. No, I, I'm, neither can I. And I think that what you've seen is you've seen in all four of these teams and both of these matchups – netminders that are absolutely stellar the ncdc has proven that it is a haven for great netminding talent and not just talent that already exists but it's about developing talent right we're all familiar you know if you've watched the show about the story of bevilacqua right going from a, a, a terrible first season to being where he is today because of the development right because of the ncdc path and just year after year, this league continues to produce top-notch netminding that goes on to next levels across the country and it finds itself being drafted by the NHL. So I, I think that it feels right that this series might come down to netminding. The road and the career for Nicholas Bevilacqua should be studied by everyone trying to develop talent at this level of the game. 2021 season, 18 games played in net, 1-12-3-1. He had a 476 goals against and an 862 saves percentage. He's playing for a team that was a bit overmatched. He was getting beat up a little bit in net. Bounces back and in 22 23, puts it together. 36 games played. He goes 21 8 3 and 1. 2 8 3 goals against a 919 saves percentage. What a turnaround for him. Then, you know, just caps off his junior career. In 37 games played this year with PAL on the road to potentially a back-to-back Deneen Cup title run for this PAL team, 34 
two and one, a one nine six goals against average, and a nine four eight saves percentage over thirty seven games played. That is unreal, Lucas. He's faced fourteen hundred and eight shots, and only seventy three have gotten by him. This kid has had such an incredible turnaround in his career. The development, the growth as a player, as a person, Nicholas Bevilacqua might just be one of the best stories in the history of junior hockey. And I don't think that's overstated, right? It, it shows it shows his personal fortitude. It shows personally that he's willing to get out there and grind. And I think he's a huge asset to to any any coach at any level of the game. And I say might be because let's look at the other net. Let's look at the other tail of the tape. Let's look at another incredible story of growth and development in this league. 21-22, Ryan Keyes finds himself also in a place where the team in front of him a bit overmatched that season, a tough year for him. 3-5-1-0 in 12 games played in the NCDC, a 4-8-8 goals against an 8-4-4 Sage percentage. Comes back in 22-23 with Robbie Brods and the Mercer Chiefs. We love the Mercer Chiefs. 19 games played, 10 wins, 6 losses, no OT losses, 2 shootout losses. A 308 and a 914, a much better season for the young man. Then he comes to South Shore in the Foxborough. And in 41 games played, goes 31-7, 2-1, 206 goals against, a 926 age percentage, and on 1,135 shots faced, allows only 84 passed. To watch Ryan Keyes grow has been just as stellar as watching Nicholas Bevlacqua grow. And this is what this level is all about, right? It's about putting guys in a position where they can succeed, and these two have had that in bunches. I think so, and I think what it shows, again, is, is how great of a development structure exists. And just the talent level, right? This is going to be fun. The, the games all season long have been a lot of fun to watch in the NCDC. This is a series that if you are a fan of these two teams, if you're a parent, um, if you're a coach who enjoys watching hockey, put out some snacks, right? Yeah. Get the get the friends and family over to watch these series because these are games that are just going to be a lot of fun to watch. If you're in the vicinity, the Northwell Health Ice Center, Dan, you and I have been there quite a bit, the ice sheet. We love it there. We love the Foxborough Sports Center. We've been there a bunch, right? All these places are great places to go watch hockey. Flow Hockey is, of course, another great place, league partner, that's not only going to show all of these games, but is also going to help us produce the Deneen Cup Championship at the uh, Eastern Host Teams facility. Yeah, the Dan K Show will be on your call. We go through the top scores for South Shore. Justin Ryan, six goals, one assist, seven points. Kotaro Marase, two goals, five assists, seven points. Jack DeRusso with one, five, and six. Karim Gayfolin, four, one, and five. And Hunter Bruce, two, two, and four. Lucas, it is time to make a prediction. I start first this go around. I love Mike Marku. I love Frank Bichara. I love what PAL does. I love this roster. I love Brian Rascona on the call. I love this, the attitude in this building. Don't ever sleep on PAL. They say it all the time. Northwell Health Ice Center, this is a tough place to go play. They're starting this series Thursday, 4.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Thursday, April 11th. Then game two, 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Friday, April 12th. Then they go back to Foxborough, 4.30 on Monday, with a potential game for 2 p.m. on Tuesday, April 16th. South Shore. I've watched the tactician that is Tyler Holsky get it done time and time again. They feel like the hottest team left in the tournament. We've seen what South Shore can do in a big game. We've seen how dominating they can be at times. Oh, this is a tough pick. This is ripping a bandit off. I think this goes five games. I think it goes five games. I think it goes five. But I love a redemption story. I love a team answering back working against the, all the trials and tribulations. South Shore went 1-1-1-0 one, 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 oh against this PAL team this year. PAL 2-1-0. Oh, Lucas, I mean, you can go either way. You could pick either side. Uh, South Shore. I think Tyler Olski gets it done. How about you? Well, there's a reason I'm wearing this hat today. 
And Ooh. it's, I'm not a person that hides. I don't sneak around with my intentions. I'm basically going to tell you what I'm all about, right? And I, for the same reason that I like Utah, I like South Shore. I like the way that South Shore handled business with the Islanders Hockey Club. That was surprising to me. Maybe not as much the outcome, but I think the way that it was done should be terrifying for not just PAL, but for both Ogden and Utah. They were a terrifying hockey team to watch. There was nothing that could have been done to stop them. I don't think PAL is going to stop them here. I also like a redemption story. I like their hats. I like the little rope they got going across the front. Big fan of the rope hat. Big fan of South Shore in four games. I think this goes four games, and I think South Shore hosts the Deneen Cup, which means that, Dan, you and I would be going to Foxborough to call those. Can't put this out there. We're going to get booed so hard. If this if this championship is at Northwell Health Ice Center and PAL wins, we are getting booed. Well, this is the way this is this is out. why we've created the Dan K bump, right? Because if if the South Shore Kings now are victorious in the East, we picked them, right? They they heard our call to victory and they answered. And if PAL wins, listen, we helped them out by giving them something to rally around and end up defeating the South Shore Kings. So either way, I think we're covered. 100%. I, I mean, I love this PAL team. I talk about them all the time, and I hope they know that. I hope they know. We always make these selections, right? We make these picks, whether it's out west, me picking against Utah, or here picking against PAL. We want this to be bulletin board material, right? We love these guys, man. We love watching this game. We love being able to promote it. We want it to feel like this is the NHL Stanley Cup coming up. That's what we want, right? And that's what we're here for. We're here for you all. We will always be here for the families, for the players, for the parents, for everyone in between. We're here for you all great organizations around the country. The Dan K Show, your most watched show in junior hockey. We will continue to be here for you as long as they let us. Lucas Jones, your parting words for NCDC this week. So long, farewell, Avita saying goodbye. Do, 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 do. When Dan Keys on the mic, it's always hockey night. Sorry for the song.